Hi, my name is Adam Hanlon. I'm the editor of WetPixel, and I'd like to welcome you to WetPixel Live. I'm joined by our resident expert on all things underwater, Alex Mustard. Hi, Alex. Hi, Adam. Nice to see you. Nice to see you too. Um, and we're going to tap into Alex's expertise today um, when we're going to talk about dome ports. And really the topic that I thought I would, the question I thought I'd throw to Alex is um, why are, is dome port selection and size so important? So over to you, Alex. I think this is this is a, you know one of the you know most common questions in underwater photography. Yep. And it comes up really for two reasons. First of all, dome ports are an expensive piece of equipment and obviously that makes photographers and particularly new underwater photographers question why do I need to spend all that money mm. and then I think it's also it's because this is the the reason that they are so fundamental is something that as a land photographer you never come across yep. you know you put your lens on your camera you take pictures yep. and actually with a, a dome port is adding a whole nother optical layer to that process get it right you get the most out of your camera get it wrong, you can throw away a huge amount of your image quality, and which is a really significant thing. If you're spending, you know, $10,000 on putting together a full frame SLR or mirrorless system with a housing, yep. and then you're trying to skimp a few hundred dollars on the difference between one dome port and another, yep. you need to think very carefully about that because you're often throwing away a huge amount of the, the, the image quality that you've paid for by using that big system. And I think that that's the important thing. Yeah. I think the other reason why this is such a critical issue is this is something that you can get sorted out before you go in the water. Yeah. So this image quality that you're getting from your system um, by getting it all set up right is something that is, is done at the setup stage. It's nothing to do with how good a diver you are or how good an underwater photographer you are. Get it right and you're realizing that full potential. Get it wrong, you're throwing away a huge amount of your potential image quality. Yep. Um, and also understanding this problem, I think, also allows you to make the right decisions when you maybe get into quite a challenging situation and you need to compromise your settings and things like that in, or, or in order to, 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 to get the shot you want. So understanding these things. I don't want this to be a, a bore fest. I want this to be kind of a, a short, sharp, watchable thing. I've recorded, and I know you have as well, Adam, you know, plenty of long talks that really explain dome ports. Mm. and all the details of them. This is very much an overview, hopefully very watchable session about it. So that's why I'd say as, as an introduction is that they're absolutely fundamental part of the imaging process for wide angle pictures underwater and get them right, you get that full potential from your camera, get them wrong, you throw away a lot of image quality. And I mean, the, the image quality is also, it's not just what you spent on your camera and and housing and accessories. It's also, of course, you know, the, the money you spent on travel and, and time you've invested in all those sort of things as well. So, so you know, it's a big deal. You want to be getting in the water, maximizing your potential to get that once in a yeah. so, picture. So a couple of general rules is that the larger the sensor in your camera, and a lot of photographers are drawn towards cameras, cameras with big sensors like full frame um, SLRs or mirrorless cameras, right. the larger the sensor in the camera, the more critical your dome port choice is. Um, if you shoot a micro four thirds mirrorless camera, you have a little bit more flexibility to use a wider range of dome ports, particularly smaller dome ports. If you're shooting on full frame cameras, you really need to take this very seriously and make sh and consider that investing in an expensive large dome port is pretty much fundamental to get the most out of your system. Um, yeah, I think I think that's important. You know, obviously with with you mentioned mirrorless and oftentimes people will look at the mirrorless systems and say well but a mirrorless full frame camera has the same optical issues as uh, uh, an slr so so you know there's no difference on this once you go to a big sensor your your dome port options as you said already alex become your dome port choices become more critical absolutely and i think yeah. i think the bottom line is when we're talking about size on dome ports is the bigger the dome port the better the optical quality. And that's pretty much a guarantee. You know, you will get, it, the bigger you go, the better it's going to be. Now, there's yeah. all sorts of other issues it around really, that. Yeah, it doesn't matter really whose name is on it. No. It, it's the size and shape. And obviously, if it's, it needs to be well made. But, um, you know, mo they're nearly all well made that are on the market. But anyone who turns around and tells you that a six inch dome port is going to give you the same results as a 12 inch dome port is, is, is frankly mistaken. That's not the case. You may well be able to get acceptable results with a six inch dome port. That's absolutely true. But you would get 
better results for the 12 inch dome port and that's mm. that's universally true i don't think there's there's any mm. there's any evidence to suggest that you can get around yeah that. I see many people are using 12 inch dome ports but yeah it's yes, right. sorry, it's, yeah. Um, big dome no, ports, yeah. it's um i think the, the key message in all of that is that from a full frame camera bigger is better the camera will still work with a small dome port you're just sacrificing a lot of image quality and the reason that this comes up again and again and again is small dome ports are cheaper to buy easier to travel with and they do make it easier to photograph small subjects from close and particularly to light so there's lots of advantages in using a small dome port however if you've chosen to go down a full frame camera route you have to be aware that choosing to use that small dome port is going to significantly impact the image quality of your picture and so you need to use one with care and with that understanding. Okay, so that's kind of size. What about materials, Alex? What, what about material choices in domes? What, what should we be looking for? Well, domes typically come in two materials. They obviously, got to be, got to be um, translucent, um, <laughs> transparent even. Um, they're either made of acrylic like this one, um, or they're made of glass like the one you've got there. Yep. Um, personally, I don't think either material is bad at all optically, and I'll happily use both. Um, glass is much stronger and much more resilient to scratches. Acrylic dome ports are scratched very easily, but they're also polished clean very easily. But each time you polish them, because it's impossible to get them back to that perfect hemisphere, you do end up tend to have flat spots and the image quality starts to go downhill with them. So mm. acrylic dome ports, cheaper to buy, lighter for travel, mm. but can be scratched more easily, but can be fixed, can be polished out. Glass dome ports, more expensive to buy, if they're scratched, it's often the end of them really being used. It's very hard to polish that scratch out. Yeah. But minor scratches tend to fill with water and not show up very much. Yeah. Um, but they might catch the, the flare and, and, and cause a flare. Um, they're more hard wearing. And the majority of serious underwater photographers use glass dome ports more of the time. Um, I think with the bigger domes, um, particularly if you're a full frame photographer, a really big 9 inch or 230 mil um, acrylic dome, yeah. can be very positively buoyant and can be almost impossible to trim with a housing and you spend your whole time with wrist ache because your housing's really pulling up. Yeah. A glass nine inch dome on most of the housings tends to leave you with a fairly well handling rig. It will still pull up to the surface a little bit, but nowhere near as much. Yeah, yeah. So um, yeah, I would say that the bigger domes, you're better off going glass because they, they can be quite hard to handle. In with with my, uh, my super dome, I actually, my nine inch dome, I actually have some wheel balancing weights that I velcroed onto the bottom of it. Um, and, and that, that, I mean, but they're very small and that deals with that. It, it avoids yeah. the, uh, the, the twisting action on, on your arms, on your, on your wrist that helps. Yeah. Yeah. On my housing, I find that the whole rig is neutral with the big dome on. So, mm. and I, it does, pull slightly up with the floats but by the time i've actually pulled the strobes back i find yeah. it actually trims very nicely in the water it off, yeah. so yeah, yeah so i i don't but yeah for an acrylic dome i would definitely consider the the wheel balance thing yeah. and a lot of those wheel balancing leads have actually got sticky plastic sticky on them anyway yeah. so you can buy them and put them on underwater they, they work pretty well yeah. um then i think the next thing that is really critical and perhaps a little bit overlooked sometimes in these discussions is having the right port extensions is as important as having the right domes. When I did a big article on dome ports for WetPixel and did a lot of work with, with Nauticam in their test tank, and we ran lots of simulations on the computer and also in the test tank. And what we found is that actually a big nine inch dome with the wrong port extension was actually worse than a, a tiny four inch or 100 mil dome with the right port extension. Yeah. So big domes outperform small domes significantly, but if you use the wrong port extension with it, you will throw away a lot of that image quality, particularly with a non-fisheye lens. And, and extension length is not a simple, you can't just look at a, the way a lens fits into a dome port and extension and assume that that's correct. Um, it's based around the lens's nodal point, which may or may not be the front of the lens. Um, so, so this is something you really need to establish by testing. So the only way to find out what the correct extension is for a given lens and dome combination is is to have tested it. Now the good news is, of course, the manufacturers have largely done that for us. So, so with the majority of the of the lenses that um, that we use regularly underwater, you will be able to consult a manufacturer's port list. Mm -hmm. um, if you're planning to use, a it is lens... always a bit disconcerting though that quite a lot of them end up in round numbers. Yeah, which suggests it's this is the extension that works best. 
yeah, just use the 40 mil or the 20 mil or the 30 mil. I think they, yeah. there was talk about the 1017, which needed a, was it a 17 mil? Or it was uh, it's a, about, well, yeah, I, I think it works optically best with a, a, an 18 mil. Yeah. But um, you get some cutoff. Um, yeah. And you definitely get cut off if you use a 20 mil with it. But it, it varies a bit from housing to housing. Yeah, because that's the other point is obviously that the, the, the position of the camera inside the housing varies. So so this is why it's very, very specific. And the only I mean, truthfully, the only way you'll ever know precisely is by testing it yourself. But for most people, consulting the manufacturer's port chart is is a, is a is as close as you need to be. Um, but, but, but it's, it's yeah, critical. Particularly so with the non fisheye lenses, it's really important to get those port extensions right. And it can really transform how well those lenses work. If you've been yeah. using, say, a 1635 on full frame camera with yeah. the wrong port extensions, you'll always be struggling with soft corners. Yeah. Suddenly you put the right port extension on, you're like, wow, this lens really performs underwater. Yeah, yeah. And a lot of the disappointment that photographers feel with some of those lenses can be just because they've constantly run them with the wrong port extensions. Yeah. And I think that probably brings us on to the, the sort of final point about dome ports is, is that lens choice is still critical. And there are some very, very good top side lenses that don't work well behind ports. And mm. by contrast, there are some relatively inexpensive and poor quality wise um, top side lenses that work very well behind dome ports. And it's mm. not simply a function. You know, we tend to look at lenses in the old days. We look at lenses f2.8 meant it was a quality lens and it was capable of producing great imagery. That's, of course, true, but it doesn't necessarily imply behind a dome mm. port. Um, and a, a classic example that has long been quoted on that is in, in Nikon speak, is Nikon's most expensive wide angle zoom lens for rectilinear shooters. Um, was the 14 to 24 very expensive f2.8 lens? The 16 35, a cheaper f4 lens, clearly outperforms it behind a dome port. Yep. And yep. it's why the majority of underwater photographers are using 16 35s, not 14 24s. Um, so so this is this is somewhere where really you know particularly if you're coming from a background of being a land shooter and planning to house a camera to take underwater, um, you know this is something where you really need to consult your dealer or the wet pixel forums or some sort of information with someone who can give you guidance on this. Cause it's very easy to make some fairly expensive mistakes at this point and, and, mm. and choose to house a lens or choose to try and house a lens that really isn't going to do very well underwater. And it may be mm. simpler to go with a, a cheaper, less expensive option. Um, mm. And that's, that's an important, that's, I think that's an important consideration as well. Yeah. Uh, and you have to ask the right lenses of the dealers, because if you ring the dealer up and say, I've got a 14, 24 and I want to house it, yeah. they'll tell you how to house it. Yeah. You know, they won't I mean, go, whoa, 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 you know, you should be, you know, so I think it's, yeah, the forums are a great place for that, that sort of advice. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Mm. And, you know, it's so, so it really is, you know, the, 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 this is a commonly debated topic or discussed mm. topic on the, on the WebEx of forums. Mm. Um, and, and I think, you know, that's a good place to go to get info. Yeah, for sure. Mm. When I was doing this, the, um, all the work with Nauticam, we tried to figure out what it was about lenses that made them particularly suitable and where we sort of ended up concluding was we felt that it was how the lens performed when focused close that really matters in terms of how well it works behind a dome port. Mm. And the majority of really expensive wide angle lenses are not optimized for how well they work when focused at one foot 30 centimeters. Yeah. They're optimized to work really well at you know two, two meters, six foot to infinity. Yeah. And actually that's why certain lenses work well when they work well when their optics are, uh, work particularly well when focused close, they tend to work well behind a dome port. Which and that's not something that tends to be designed in. Yeah. It tends to be something that's just a little bit by luck, really. It's happy the manufacturers of, yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Brilliant. A another place, of course, we can go to seek um, advice on lenses, looking at what other people are using to achieve um, their imagery. Um, and Alex lists his lenses on his website, I think. Yes, you can search on the focal lens. Um, it can be a little bit tricky because a lot of the wide angle photo lengths are also sort of dates or times. If you type 12 in, you're not just going to find 12 to 24s. Yeah. Um, so, but it can work, yeah, particularly if you, uh, yeah, so, um, yeah. But it, you can search my website like that. And there's some advice I've written on my website to be able to pull that up. It's usually best to write something like 13.0 um, to get pictures from a 13 mil fisheye because that, uh, for whatever reason, the lenses report the 0 0.0 after them. In yeah. focal length. But yeah, yeah, you can find them on my website with a bit, and there's some advice on there to help you search for lenses. Sure. And actually, just seeing how many pictures I have from particular lenses is a very good um, 
choice. If you've only got a couple of pictures, there's probably a good reason why I'm not using that lens. Yeah, yeah. And certainly I think the same. I, I do the same with my Lightroom library. You can uh, <laughs> you can search by lens choice. So so Alex's website's at amos.com. Um, yep. So have a look at that. Um, um, thank you very much, Alex. Um, I'd like to thank Cinebags Underwater for sponsoring this episode. Um, please feel free to ask any questions about Dome Choices in the comment section below and drop us a like if you enjoyed it or got value from this episode. Thank you very much. We'll see you soon.